Okay, so before we begin, a couple of things that you should probably um, do if you haven't done it already is uh, as we go forward in the next few days, we're actually going to need to power things up. So you should begin by, um, by charging your batteries, right? So in a collection, you've got uh, two batteries and you've got your uh, battery charger, okay? So what we want to do is if you get a chance this morning at the first break, for instance, um, let's charge our batteries when we, uh, so that we're all ready to go. Now, a couple of points about charging the batteries is the battery chargers will have two settings on them, I believe, right? On our current chargers, okay? Um, there's a 0.9 amp charge setting, so there's a little slide on it, okay? Uh, and then there's another uh, setting on there. For general charging of the batteries, you wish to use the uh, 0.9 amp setting or the lower setting, all right? Um, this is the, the trickle charge, and this will allow you to have the greatest life in your batteries. So one of the things that's in the full documentation is a discussion on batteries, battery charging, uh, battery life, and so on. But the only time that you want to charge those batteries on the higher settings is generally in an emergency. So if I'm at the competition and I need to get that battery to full charge, then I will use that higher setting on the battery charger um, because it'll, it'll fast charge the battery. But overall, with the elasticity of the battery, um, especially if you're not conditioning your battery, uh, what will happen is it'll, it'll uh, make the battery life longer or, or, or less, sorry. So, you know, batteries do not, do not last forever. Um, we're going to look at the triangle-based robot today. And one of the reasons that we're going to do that is that it, in your collection, you have four DC motors. And what this will enable us to do uh, is it will enable us to have one DC motor free uh, by building this base so that we can use it for another purpose, which is in our little um, training unit that we're going to talk about uh, and show you how it goes together and builds as well. So um, what you want to do, if you want to write this down when you get the break, if we're going to build this, um, this base, is we're going to start with um, 3, 336 channel, which is part number 76012, okay? You will need three 120 degree brackets, which is part number 760, uh, 76080-2, okay? So those brackets will come in a, in a package of two. All right, when you're going to get them. And what you're going to have, and if you don't have it, we put it in the uh, downloads for last night, is there will be a checklist of all your parts that you get in the collection, and you'll see a picture identifier. So it makes it nice and easy for you to find the parts that are required. Um, all you have to do is look at the part number. Uh, they're in order, some of them, and some of them aren't. So, you know, uh, just go down and find it, and then you'll see a picture so that you can match it. Uh, what I suggest you do is, is it keep that handy because, you know, if you're going to refer to part numbers like I am, once they're out of the box and your students have them in, in different spots, then it gets quite difficult for them um, to find them. So the picture's a very good visualization idea. Um, why do I want to do that and know that I'm organized? Well, if they're all in one great big bin together and I'm at the middle of a competition and they're not organized and I have 45 minutes to build something, I don't want to waste 30 minutes of that trying to find the right part. So let's keep our parts organized um, and understand where they are. You're going to need three Omni wheels for the triangle based robot. So those are 76260. And you're going to need some 48 millimeter U channel. Um, the 48 U millimeter U channel comes in uh, a pack of two. So that's a 76018 2, um, not 20. Sorry about that. Uh, should be a bracket at the end of that. You'll need three motor mount plates to build the standard base, and that's what we're going to do, 761400. And, of course, you'll need three Maverick motors. Right? So we're just going to build the, the simple base for the motor. So I'll leave that slide up there a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's got, uh, got a pen handy, um, but those are the general parts that you wish to do. And you'll have more time uh, when you're going to do it. Now, for your reference, at the end of the session this afternoon, we'll post today's presentation, okay? And in the post of the presentation, we will give you the step files or the CAD files for all of the base models and training models that we are going to discuss in this session, okay? 
okay? So you will have the completed CAD models. I've already um, set them up in a folder, okay? And we'll post them. So yes, we will post at the end of the session. I know at the very end of, of what we do, we get these emails. Will you please post this? Um, yes, we will. But what you have to remember is that we are recording the sessions. They get uploaded to the cloud. So it takes two or three hours for that to um, get all compiled up there and compressed properly so that we can then download it and put it out and, and put that on the share for you. Um, so you will get it before the end of the day, our time today, um, you've got it ready to go. So uh, begin charging your batteries. You need two of the 330, three of the 336 channel. They're the longest channel in your collection. Three packs of the 120 degree brackets, three Omni wheels, two 48 millimeter channel, three motor mount plates and three Maverick motors. Right? You will also need an assortment of uh, fasteners. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'll just show you what we've done here quickly. Put those underneath that camera, right? Just so that you're all ready to go. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Okay, and James will flip over. So you want to get some fasteners together. I have um, only shown you two bins. So I have some eight millimeter and some 10 millimeter um, M3 socket heavy cap screws. And I'm using Kep nuts because I'm going to uh, reassemble and disassemble this all the time. All right. So I just like to keep things a, a little bit organized so they're not all over the place. Uh, it's just the way I am. Okay. And if I didn't keep things organized properly, Kale would be upset at me. So I must keep things organized as I go through. All right. I will go back. And be ready to go. So once again, just a quick review while you're getting your parts together um, about the collection. So the, the World Skills collection, you'll now see those new parts as we begin to build the larger aluminum um, that we've got, uh, 48 millimeter wide channel, longer lengths, uh, bigger, stronger, faster, as we say. Uh, the drive motors that you're going to need. Uh, we are going to do a few different designs and we'll talk about some tips and tricks uh, on these designs going forward. All right. And, you know, we're going to do a little bit of wiring here. We're going to talk about motor control as we get going. So there's a lot of different concepts that we can master um, when using the world skills collection. Okay. So it can be integrated into lots of different learning opportunities uh, for your students. All right. So let's talk about our base structure. Um, some people call it the base structure. Some people call it the core robot. Um, some people call it the drive system because generally that robot base is, is uh, what contains the drive system. Um, these are a few points that I, I talk to people about. Number one, we're dealing with a mobile robot. So that base structure is what provides the mobility. And therefore it is the most important thing on your robot. So this is what I sit down and design first, okay? And I think about it and we put that together and we come up with a iterative designs and we think about what is best for our base robot, right? You know, and then we do our troubleshooting and we'll go through when we do our, our design journals or our engineering notebooks and we'll say what worked and what didn't work um, as we go forward. The drivetrain or the base robot must meet your strategy goals. So if you remember yesterday, I, I talked about sitting down, reviewing the channel or the, the challenge, okay? And then breaking the challenge out, okay? In the individual steps and stages. Those individual steps and stages are gonna set my strategy. So I have to think about it. Is it accuracy versus speed? Is it, you know, mobility in one direction such as forward and back versus mobility and rotation and turning? So what kind of strategy am I going to have? Third thing that you have to think about is it can, can it be built with your resources? And this is a general slide, okay? Um, we know that in world skills right now, you have some design limitations on your resources. But, you know, remember that if you're using the collection and you're designing for other competitions or just for challenges uh, within your university or college, uh, what resources do you have available? So what happens is, you know, a lot of times people come up with great ideas and we were discussing this this morning. Well, you can just build this. Well, no, you can't just build this. 
because someone may not have the resources to do that. Uh, you want to make sure that that base chassis uh, rarely needs maintenance and that you're able to get at that. And as I say here, can be fixed within four minutes. Where did I come up with four minutes? I have no idea. I probably made it up. Okay. Um, as I tell people, when something breaks on your robot, it's going to break 45 seconds before you need it. All right. So it's just the way it works out. We did this training session about a month ago and we were doing um, teleoperation and everything worked fine up until the 30 seconds before we went to use it and then nothing, okay? Right in the middle of the training. So a little bit embarrassing for us, uh, but as we say, you know, adapt and, uh, and overcome. And if you notice my last point on here is the same as the first point on the slide. It is more important than anything else on your robot. So what you want to do when you're designing is we usually sit down and design the base, the core, the drive system. And, you know, if I have a couple of competitors, well, I may have one who is, is working on that system. He's using multiple motors, multiple drive systems, multiple configurations, and testing it to make sure that it's the best one that meets our strategy. Okay. Um, he may have his own uh, VMX and his own Titan on there. He may just be using teleoperation to drive and test the functionality and the speed. And meanwhile, one of the other competitors could be working on one of the other subcomponents or sub-assemblies that we talked about yesterday. So this could be designing an object management system, designing a lift system, um, and so on. So we're getting a little bit of concurrent activity going in our engineering design. A lot of drive types that you can consider. Um, I never tell anybody exactly what the best um, solution is, okay? But there's lots of different things that you need to think about and much will be based upon your design constraints, right? So, you know, if the challenge allows it as an example, or if you think that you can do it, we could do a two wheel drive type with the current collection, all right? In other words, what we could do is we could drive two motors only Usually these would be um, the rear motor. And then the front two could be free rotating wheels on axles, right? Very easy to build, very light because you're using two less motors, at least on the chassis train, okay? Um, I use inexpensive because when I do design for students, um, I equate everything to cost, right? Because in the real world, everything is equated to cost. So if they use too much channel, if they use too many motors, if they use too many fasteners, technically they're using more money. And that's one way that we assess um, what they're gonna do, right? Um, this type of robot is generally uh, pretty agile because you can move one drive motor and spin it around. It's very easy because of the three wheels, um, but there are some drawbacks to it as well. Uh, there's not much power because you're only powering it with the two motors. Uh, generally, depending upon how you're driving it, it may not work well on a ramp, if you had a ramp. And it's also less able to hold its position accurately, right? So this is just a quick um, overview on a, on a two-wheel drive system. We're not going to get uh, too in-depth into this. Uh, a lot of the curriculum that we're doing will talk more and more and more about these drive systems. We could have a four wheel drive system, but only using two gear motors, all right? Um, I haven't seen this that much in, in world scales. I know some people had, uh, had played with it. Um, and in this case, what we're doing is we're driving all four wheels, but we're driving all four wheels by two motors. Uh, this type of design, what has happened is we've used the sprocket or, or belt that is provided uh, between the two motors. So the one motor is, is driving the front and the back and one motor is driving the front and the back using a chain or belt drive to power both motors. This once again is fairly easy to design and easy to build. You're using just a square frame four wheeled structure. Um, it's a little bit more powerful because you are driving more wheels. Um, it's sturdy and stable, okay? Uh, the difficulty with this is that, you know, small, small turning increments are very, very difficult and you are gonna need a little bit of adjustment, right? You have to make sure that your belts are properly tightened, that your chain uh, is properly on and adjusted, okay? 
So there are some little um, configuration uh, options that are going to be here. And there's multiple configurations that you could do with this. Um, in our case here in this top diagram, what I have is I have the motors uh, directly on the drive wheels, but I could put the motors in the center and I could use um, sprockets on each wheel to drive them. Why would I do that? Because my motor in the center is going to make the weight uh, a little bit more stable and we'll talk more about center of gravity uh, as we go forward and have a look at it. Um, four wheel drive, four motor. This is generally what we find most people build to start. Okay, so they build a frame, they put four motor mounts on it, and they drive four wheels. Uh, I'm not sure why all the time. Um, some of the the experts would know better because I would assume that when the competitors read their technical journals to them, they do exactly what I'm doing when they talk about the drive system. We tried this. We didn't. We found that it was not this. It was this or that. Okay, and we went to this and we found this and then we went to this, all right? So it's the iterative design. Uh, I think a lot of people do this because immediately they look in the collection and they see four wheels and four motors and go, yes, let's do it. Okay, uh, But it's another option and we'll show you some um, structures that you can do uh, as we get going forward today to be able to put this together. It is also fairly easy to design and easy to build. It's more powerful because you're driving with four motors, okay? It's more sturdy and stable because the weight is more balanced on the robot as, as one of the criteria. And you have multiple options. So we have mechanic wheels we could add to this robot. We have increased traction that we could add to this robot. Uh, it is going to be heavier. And you know we do not give you at this point in time a weight restriction um, in world skills. Okay, I'm not saying that would never happen. Um, I think Bob's on. So in the future, you know, a weight restriction could be one of the criteria because there are design criteria that are provided uh, a lot of times uh, when you're designing anything at all, right? So think about I uh, watch Ford versus Ferrari the movie. And, you know, when they're trying to beat Enzo Ferrari with the Ford, the weight restriction was, was a great, great uh, issue that they had. Trying to reduce the weight on the car when they were designing it so that they could get better speed performance and less drag. Uh, so it is a bit heavy. And, it, and if you're using cost as a factor in your design, you're using four motors. So technically it is more costly. So here's a couple of chassis designs um, that we've got, or one chassis design that you can look at. Um, in this case, with this chassis design, it's just going to use two 366 channel, right? And I believe those are two 144 channel. Or are those 288s? No, that's a 416 with the okay. a 288. Yeah, so it's a 416 with a 288. But you get the general idea of the um, of the frame structure that's going to happen there. Uh, basically, what happens on the shorter sections that go in the middle, and we'll just show you on a short piece. Okay, we've taken a, a robot mount plate, so we put one robot mount plate. So there's end one piece. fastened there. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, end piece plate. Okay, so that's an end piece plate. That's a seven six one four three. And you get two of those in a pack. So you take that end plate and then you can put one on one side and one on the other. We've only got one on this one because we're going to be building with this a little bit later. And then that can be used as the core center frame structure. All right. We're putting the two longer uh, channels down to form that base when you're going to work through it. Okay, so that forms that core uh, structure that you see there. And then what's happened with our motors on the bottom here, we've used two 48 millimeter U channel packs. So there's two in a pack, okay, two pieces. We open that up and then we put the motor mount plate, the 76140 on, and we can mount those motors um, directly into the frame structure. So, you know, base frame. Um, there you go. We leave the front open on this. Uh, the reason we leave the front open in this case, okay, is because we may or may not want to use this uh, robot to pick up an object. 
So a lot of the stuff that we do here when we're doing robot designs, we have what's called an intake where we scoop up an object. So we do that at the front by forming a horseshoe pattern, okay? So that we can drive the robot in and, and we're gonna pick up that object and we can line it up on the object. So that's why that is a horseshoe shape instead of just a square box. Um, it's because we may want an intake. The other reason that we have to think about that is that I have to think about where I'm going to mount the electronics and other objects right now. So I may want to move that channel back so that I can put a platform on there, for instance, to put either my batteries or my Titan, okay, or my VMX motor controller to form a stable base. Whoops. Um, we're now going to talk about drive types and I'm going to talk about the omnidirectional drive types. So we put omnidirectional wheels in the um, standard collection. Um, they are a unique wheel because they can roll um, freely in two directions. All right. Why do we do that? Uh, because we give you a little bit more design control. So when you're using an omnidirectional wheel, it can either roll like a normal wheel, which is great. So we can do um, normal wheel. And one of the reasons that we upgraded your omnidirectional wheels to the two-piece wheel and changed the durometer on the little rollers was so that we could match the same grip that we would get from our standard four-inch wheel that you gave you. So we did a little bit of testing uh, uh, over the old wheels and the new wheels, and we found that under load, um, we are getting the same coefficient of friction with our omni wheel working just like a normal wheel that we did with our previous regular four inch wheels. These wheels will also allow you to uh, roll laterally, okay, using the wheels along the circumference. So these will allow my robot now to convert from a non holonomic drive, a holonomic drive, to a holonomic drive robot, right? So we get a little bit of uh, flexibility with the design. So that's why you get those uh, omnidirectional wheels, give you multiple design choices with one wheel. When we talk about this type of robot with omnidirectional, um, there are generally uh, two types of designs that you can do. There's a four wheel drive. Uh, so there's a diagram of a four wheel drive, holonomic there, and there's a three wheel drive. Okay. Um, generally, the mechanics is fairly simple. You have all of the component parts to build these uh, uh, with the new angle plates or angle brackets that we give you. Okay, so as an, uh, as an example, when we're going to build the three wheel, we now give you 120 degree brackets. Okay. And if you're going to build a four wheel for mounting, uh, we give you brackets that will enable you to do that as well. Um, generally simple mechanics. You do get immediate turning, uh, fairly simple control uh, with either the three or the four wheel because of the three or four wheel independent drive. All right. Um, there's minimal pushing power with this robot because you have to remember that you're not getting a full drive of the motors when you're going to work through it. And if you do have an incline on your court uh, or in your design, it can be a little bit difficult because you don't have full contact with all the wheels at one time, right? There's a whole plethora of pluses and minuses to this type of design, okay? Um, you know, if I'm going to have competitors who are working and they're going to do, like I said, my, my design engineering notebook, um, I'm going to have them say, okay, what are the pluses? What are the minuses? Right. Uh, you know, maybe I'll do a, uh, an analysis on it. Okay. So I'll do a little bit of the uh, good old OOP operational planning process and we'll, we'll list the pluses and minuses and then we'll arrive at the best solution for what we think our plan is going to have. All right. So a couple of different ones, and we're gonna show you how to do the three-wheel drive chassis today going forward. Okay. Um, this is the working principle, and I put the working principle in here for a three-wheel um, omni-wheel robot. This is for when you're going to uh, program and move the robot. So basically it's a quick uh, diagram that says, okay, if this is the direction that I wish to travel, all right, then this is, uh, the way that I want the wheels to turn, all right? And there's no answer to that question. No, that's not correct. There's mixture. I'm still saying. Yeah, yeah. No answer to that question, Sheldon. 
Um, it's probably, if, if we had, Sheldon's asking, um, what's the most common type of drive that we see? And I know James is, is asking him, but at any particular competition, we will see all drive types. So it just depends upon their design, all right? Um, some people have different design ideas, but it is usually uh, 30, 30, 30, 33, 33, 33. Okay, so there's no, there's no question. Uh, you have to understand the working principles of an Omni uh, wheel drive robot. And you should think about this. Um, we're gonna talk um, a little bit later when we talk about mounting as an example, the uh, VMX, okay? And we talk about the IMU and what is the zero yaw direction on the IMU or the integrated motion unit, all right? When it is mounted. Uh, you have to understand that. Uh, so we're gonna cover that for you because with the old IMU, we did have an axis mounted on it and you could see that default axis. Uh, and now with the VMX, you don't. So you have to understand which way front is, okay? And that's gonna affect the mounting and how you're gonna orient the integrated motion unit. Okay. If you have a four wheel Omni drive robot, um, on your design, these are the principles of operation when working with the four-wheel Omni-Drive robot, okay? It can be a little bit simpler uh, because in general, if you want to go forward, you're moving uh, two motors or, or all motors are going to be moving in the same direction, okay? Uh, so this just enables you when you're looking at doing that coding, uh, how you're going to put it together. So if you want to spin about, you'll see the direction of travel. If you want to go at an angle, you'll see the direction of travel. Uh, and if you want to go forward, you want to go back. A little bit more of a stable platform here, uh, and we'll discuss the, the platforms uh, going forward and having a look at it, all right? Okay, we should think a little bit about um, traction, and this is a very, very brief diagram um, looking at traction, okay? Um, the big point here when we're designing the robot sy system is that if we slip, we lose position. So in order to recover position, we usually design encoders into our system, okay? And we have to think about both dynamic braking and traction control in your design. Right? Not doing a, a full lesson on here, uh, but it'll just give you an idea in our slide when you're planning for, for your mobile robot, some of the things that you need to consider. And that's why this is here, right? So there's a little bit of math here. Um, the, so the pushing force math is there, the weight times the co friction coefficient. And I have provided some uh, friction coefficients here as well, okay? Uh, so that you can see that, the type of durometer on the wheels, which type of wheel has, has a greater coefficient of friction and so on. So you really want to look at the data sheets and material and begin to understand this. We give you one type of wheel, on your robot, um, that's the Omni wheel. So you can understand that if you had to push an object, you can generate with the coefficient based upon that, the more weight or the normal force, the pushing force is probably gonna be greater, all right? So I can't tell you if you're gonna push, pull, shoot, pick up, whatever you're gonna do, um, it's just something that you need to think about when you're gonna design, right? Center of gravity. So the center of gravity um, is very, very key um, to the robot. This is a simple, simple base diagram. Um, but remember that your center of gravity is your robot mass and it's represented at one point, okay? So your mobility increases when the center of gravity is low and the center of gravity is center, okay? So you wanna make sure that your weight is as low as possible, okay? and that your center of gravity is in the center of the robot. Right? This is very, very evident when you're trying to travel and move with the robot, especially in autonomous mode. Because if the center of gravity is off, things like traction on wheels is gonna differ from wheel to wheel. Therefore, you will get more slip. Right? If you had a mechanical wheeled robot, this would be very, very evident as well, because you get different drive from different wheels at different times. And if your encoder feedback and your PID loops aren't working correctly, then your robot is never going to have an accurate stable position. 
Um, higher parts equals lighter weight. What does that mean? So that means that if you have a tall structure on your robot, maybe you had a lift mechanism, or if you are carrying an object, right? The higher it is, the lower the weight at the bottom of the robot. And the lower the weight at the bottom of the robot makes it more tippy, as we say. And I use tippy as a general term. In other words, it's not as stable and the robot can tip over or fall over, right? So we saw this uh, quite a bit. It's not so much that we see this if you're working in autonomous mode. We see it a lot more for people that use teleoperation because they get very, very excited. And before they start driving the robot or before they drive the robot forward, they forget to lower a lift mechanism that's up that has increased the center of gravity. Also important because generally when you're testing your base of your robot and driving it around and it works well, you don't have any object management system on top of it because you're designing that base. So it works really well, it's stable, you've got good weight distribution on it, but then you find that the minute that you put any add-ons onto that robot, your whole plan is out the window. Okay. So just remember that, that the higher the parts, the lighter the robot, the lower the parts, um, the heavier the robot. And center of gravity is, is very, very important. Um, with that, I put a section in here on robot stability. So um, when the robot's either static or in motion on a plane service, uneven terrain, okay, if it's engaged with the mechanism, if it's holding or dropping an activity, or an object, your center of gravity must be well placed. Okay. So it just reiterates what I had just said before. Okay. Um, in the World Skills Challenge, most of your robot performance is on a uniform surface. Okay. Um, in the past, we have done um, different or uneven terrain. Okay. But the key here is that you have to have predictable load distribution. Right. Even if you're not traversing a ramp. Okay, or even if you have uh, flat terrain, remember you still need to have that load distribution correct. So in other words, if you're picking up an object, make sure that you're lowering the center of the gravity uh, when you are going to do it, all right? Um, if you're in teleoperated mode, I said this, usually the robot driver can adjust to changing dynamics, right? So, you know, sometimes the driver can feel that he can see that the robot is going to tip over, so he will stop, right? But in autonomous mode, this becomes a very, very critical issue, right? And we saw this uh, in preparations for Kazan. So we did some test projects and, you know, people had tried to increase the speed of their robot in order to catch up to other teams that were doing the task faster right? Or teams who were doing it even fast enough to win tried to go even faster. And by doing that, what they would do is they would change the dynamics of the robot. Uh, and therefore, they would actually perform uh, not as successful because the balance and the stability had become an issue when the robot was driving. So you have to think about it. This is an ex excerpt, this slide um, from the unit on base design, okay? I just grabbed a bunch of stuff out of it and put it up on the slide to use uh, as a reference. Yeah. All right, so we'll just review the uh, control system, okay? Uh, once again, because once we do build that base robot, we have to remember that we need access to the control system. And for us, for you know our World Skills 2021, this is generally going to involve three large components. The first one will be the, the VMX robot controller. I put the slide up with the connections on it because you have to remember that based upon what you're gonna use and how you're gonna design it, that you are going to need access to these connections. So think about it when you're laying out the base robot and you're gonna place the VMX on, what connections do I wanna make sure that I have access to, right? Don't block them in, don't hide them. So make sure you can see your CAN connector because that's how you're communicating with the Titan. And if you can't see it and something gets pulled loose, it's going to make that, you know, be ready, be able to repair the robot within 45 seconds, uh, a really, really big issue. So that would be something that would be critical. 
that I would want to make sure that I have access to and that I can see uh, all the time. Okay. Um, the Titan's got to go on there. Okay. So you should look at that. Remember that the fuses are, are going to be there. I don't think that we should have major issues where anybody is going to blow a fuse. Okay. I can't see it. Uh, the design of the system just doesn't let you generally draw more than, than the current that's allowed. Uh, but, you know, just in case, as we said, I, my name is Murphy and stuff happens. Uh, make sure that your design is set up um, so that you have access to the fuse box and that you can also see that CAN connector uh, and any of the other connectors as well. We've made this pretty simple for you. Most of the wiring um, is, is plug and play and plugs right in now. Um, so your connection should be fairly stable. The only thing that I will say is that you want to make sure that any open port, so you'll see where my um, encoders and limit switches go in. We have the pins there. If I wasn't using some of those pins, I would probably cover them up. I want to make sure that nothing has the opportunity to get in there that could short out a couple of pins and cause a problem. This could be a metal shaving. This could be, you know, somebody's lunch might do it. I don't know what people eat for lunch sometimes, but a little piece of metallic food falls in there and uh, away it goes. So if you're eating iron, try to increase your iron, it can be a problem uh, around the robot. So you may want to cover up some of those uh, just to make sure that stuff doesn't get in there. Um, this is uh, everything mounted on a robot. So I put the slide back. We had this up yesterday so that you can see it. You'll notice that the third core component there, which is the batteries, they are underneath in this design right here. Right? This has only uh, one battery on it right now, correct, on this one. So if the battery is at the back, I need to make sure that the weight distribution is countered somehow on the front. So if this was on a robot design, um, quite possibly that's where the object management system would be um, or the greater components would be. But you'll notice with the wiring that gives you a, a quick overview of the way um, that everything is set up, okay? So that you can look at that and you can see that on your robot. All right, okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a, a couple of different things. Um, for the for the base robot, uh, hopefully what you've got is you you have all your parts together um, so that you can see it. I'm just going to uh, flip over and I'll share my screen again. All right. So we're gonna start um, by building a frame uh, with the core robot. So if you take a look at this, what I'll do is I'll talk about this for about um, five minutes. Then we'll take a quick 15 minute break in order to enable you to get all of your parts together and get your fasteners out and so on in case you haven't done it. And there'll be a few um, tips and tricks. So this is a core base uh, triangle robot when you look at it. In this case, we're using three 336 channel. There's a reason we use 336 channel. And I think James wants to talk a little bit about that uh, when we get going on the next session so that we can see it, all right? Uh, you'll have a look at it. And what we've got is we've got your 120 degree brackets. So one, two, one, two, one, two here. So there's three packs um, that are gonna be there, all right? Six. So six total, cause there's two in a pack. So three packs gives us six, okay? And we have our 48 millimeter channel, all right? And the motor mount plates are in the channel so that we can mount the DC motors uh, on the system, all right? So if I take a look at that and I rotate that around a little bit, okay? You'll see exactly what's gonna be underneath and on the robot. So it's a fairly simple frame structure we have not put the fasteners in uh, on the uh, CAD model here, right? Uh, simply because everything's made it together, right? Uh, so that we can look at it. But this is what we are going to be building from that structure standpoint, right? So if you wanna get um, everything started uh, for when we come, you wanna put them in 
And we'll just show you quickly the correct orientation for when you're gonna put the motor mount plates into the channel, okay? Uh, vice the end plates into the channel because there's a little bit different uh, on the lengths when you do it. Uh, so I'll just switch over and I'll get James to show you that uh, going forward. And there we go. You got one there. Yeah, you want to show them the orientation between the two of them, right? Because one goes in the other one. One will only fit one. See this flush, right? See this not flush? Yeah. But you want to mount it this way for your design. Here. Okay. So when you look at this with the motor mount plates, both the motor mount plate, okay, and the end plate will just slide into the end of the channel. The fasteners are going to be fixed in through the sides. Okay. So the hole mounts are there. Right, and you can see that the fasteners are going to be fixed in through the sides. Okay, in our case, at this point, if you look at that um, motor mount plate, one thing to notice is the way that this is mounted in this design. Okay, is that the bottom of that motor mount plate towards the open U, it actually sticks out a little bit. Okay, so that's the way that that's going to be oriented when you mount that in the channel. All right. You could mount it the other way, but you'd have to slide it up and adjust it. So for our design right now, it's gonna be mounted. Whereas the end plate, okay, it will mount either way, right? So the orientation can go one way or the orientation can go the other way, right? And you're gonna mount those on the ends of the channel when we get to go to do that. In our current design here, we are not gonna use the, uh, the end plate right now. Uh, but I just wanted to show you the differences, okay, when you go to mount them. So when you want to put those uh, motor mount plates in, they're going to go uh, that way. And you'll just notice that it sticks out of the end of the channel, um, probably about one millimeter or 1.5 millimeters. And that's the orientation that we're going to want in this case when we put the motors in, okay? So you can pull all that stuff out uh, and get started. Uh, when you're going to go and you'll see that I'm just using uh, four socket headed cap screws to fix those in M3 by eight. Yep. M3 by eight millimeter. There's no use need to use the 10 millimeter here. Okay. Um, they're just going to be uh, too long and they might not seat properly uh, when you go forward. Okay. All right. So we'll let you get your stuff together. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the slideshow and I'm going to put the slide up with the uh, parts list for this so that you've got a quick reference of it. All right. And if you want to get all that stuff together and please remember that you need to charge your batteries. So we'll grab a battery charger as well for when we come back and we'll just show you that, uh, that setting. Okay. As we go forward. And we will see everybody at the top of the hour.
Okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, we just lowered our screen a little bit, and I'm just gonna um, stop that share. So Bob had sent a, a message, okay, that said that uh, for 48 millimeter U channel as an example, I only had two, but there's three in the build. Um, correct, but you need two packs. So when you look at the part numbers, right? I was referring to part numbers. So that part number, just so you know, the way this stuff is packed has a dash two on the end of it. So the dash two means that when you get that, that sealed package here, okay? Um, the dash two means that inside that pack, there's two, right? So refer back to your part numbers. Um, as I tell people, be clear and, and, and clarity. So, you know, maybe the next time I do it, I'll say 83 48 millimeter channel, which is just a 7601 dash or eight and not put the dash two on because if you've opened all this up, you're correct. Um, you can get a little bit confused because you've, you've dumped out all your parts going forward, okay? So that's fine. The easy way for you to understand it is to reference your CAD model, okay, when you're gonna do that, right? So Sheldon just asked, it's the same thing. Do I need six 120 degree brackets or three? No, you need three packs, the dash two, uh, which does equal um, six total, okay, when you're going to put this frame together, right? Now, think about this frame that uh, that we're working on when we do it. And what I'm going to do is start to build because I'm lazy, and then I'm going to switch to a fully built frame, um, is that we are using the 336 channel, right? And one of the reasons we use the 336 channel is for, for two reasons. Number one is to allow us to have enough space on top um, to mount all of the electronics. And number two is if we count holes, right? We see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And if we tried to make a smaller frame, this is the 288, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if you think about it, we're gonna mount our wheels in the center of the frame. There's no way to mount the wheels in the center of the frame here, right? Because it would be off center because there's six holes as opposed to seven. So with seven, I get equal space on either side. Not to use the other motor mount. Right, okay. You could do it with the smaller frame, but you would have to alternate your design and you could use the other motor mount, right? So it just depends what you wanna do. So remember, there's no right, there's no wrong way here. We are simply building a sample structure, that's it, right? So that's why we're using that. And that's part of those design principles when we do it. So there's no right way, there's no wrong way. We're just doing a sample, that's all we are. The other thing that we're gonna do is that when we go to mount the channel together, okay, we are gonna use the 10 millimeter socket headed cap screw. And the reason that we're gonna do that is what I discussed yesterday, is that when I have two pieces of material or two pieces of channel or plate and put them together, I want to make sure there's enough thread on the outside for the kept nut or the nylock nut to go on and to have some thread there so that if it starts to loosen off, it doesn't pop up and cause instability, right? So that's uh, what you want to do. Very simple to do. You're going to start with your top frame. You're going to take your channel. You're going to face your channel outwards, right? And you're going to use a 120 degree on either corner, all right? And we mount the um, channel outwards, right? James wants to cover it, so I'll let him give you his little blurb on mounting the channel uh, outwards, okay? Uh, the reason we use the outwards is if you were to have it inwards like this, you couldn't get your hands in there. Right? right. Okay, so simple things. He does it so that we can get our hands in underneath because we're gonna take the uh, frame here and what we're gonna do with it is we're gonna align it with the socket headed cap screws, okay? And I wanna make sure that once I do that, okay, that I'm able to get inside and underneath here, okay? So that I can actually get and put the cap nut on it. And for guys like me with great big monster hands, it's nice to have the 48 millimeter channel because I can actually get my hands in there to work with, 
All right. So what you're going to do is you're going to line this up. Okay, we are going to use four um, screws, maybe for my initial design, if I was going to take this apart, um, you know, a little bit later today, I would use two. But what you want to do is you want to begin to assemble your frame structure and remember what we said yesterday. Do not tighten up those screws. So I've just threaded them on by hand right now. I haven't gone and used the wrench to tighten them up because what I want to do is I want to make sure that the frame is properly aligned and that everything's together. And then when I go to tighten this, I'm going to tighten it at opposite corners first. I'm not going to tighten all four on one corner because then I might twist the frame out um, a little bit. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to build that, that base frame. You guys can start and get going to give myself a little bit of stability. I'm going to go and add, a couple of more on either side here, okay? And then what we'll do is we'll go back and we'll add the rest of them. All right. Okay. Now your choice, we can do the whole top part first, right? And the bottom, or we can just do the top and then go back later and we can stabilize the bottom as we go, okay? You'll see me dropping screws big fingers, and so on. All right. All right. All right. And one more of the three. Uh, 36, and we'll begin to put it together. So I'll let you keep going for a minute. Um, if you have any questions, you can chat us in the chat. Or, uh, or go on the Discord. Remember to get it all lined up, okay? And you're just gonna quickly build that simple frame. Like I said, we are gonna use four socket-headed cap screws on each one, but at the very start, just to get myself a structure, I'm not gonna use four. All right, but we're gonna build that triangular base robot. All right. But what I do right now is I have the CAD model up on my screen here so that I can look at that CAD model. I can suppress certain features in it. I can use the CAD model as my parts list, okay? And I can use the CAD model as my uh, exploded diagram for my assembly as well, right? Rather than try to go off memory, it gives me explicitly what I need when I'm going to do the design. La la la. It's kind of fun. It's soothing, right? Much more exciting than looking at code and coding, I think, anyways. Just so that you can see it. All right. I'm just going to put one more on this frame for now. And then we'll talk about the movement of it. So you want to get it set up fairly stable. And then we can go. All right, you can see it really doesn't take that long to put together a quick frame, right, for testing. If you got a lot of parts in here, we could build multiple frames. And in fact, we are going to build uh, multiple frames in a second out of the same parts in the same collection. Okay, and I'm going to do all the uh, the outside ones first, simply because it's easier for me going forward. So one thing to note is we haven't tightened anything up, right? So we want to make sure that everything is all lined up. We could actually get a square and put that together. We could put a block in here, right, that was cut at an angle. Anything you want to do that's going to help you. Um, get everything uh, properly aligned before you're going to tighten everything up. The more screws you put in, the better. And then remember what I said is that when you are going to go to tighten, tighten from opposite corners first 
so that you do not get a lot of twisting. Once you get your top done, uh, before you tighten, you can go and you can add the brackets to the bottom as well, all right, to the order to put that frame together. And then once it's all there, tighten it and square it up so you should be all happy and good. Be like a pit crew and have an automatic nut holder. Become like Formula One. Right, you're ready to go. Keep your area nice and tidy. You got 120s over there? I can't see the. Oh, there it is. Never mind. Nice to be student and have lots of parts. We can just keep opening them up and away we go. Ready? Scratch my boardroom table here. So we can get ourselves a, a fairly sturdy um, and fairly square frame um, as we look at it. Now, there's a lot of different types of structures that you can do um, and you can build. All right. So as an example on this side, this is back to that, uh, that U channel that we built. Okay. And in this case, what we've done is we placed the motors right inside the channel and we've used bevel gears. Okay at two to one in our case here, right? Uh, in order to run the shafts for each one of those motors, right? So one, two, three, four. So there's another type of design that you could do uh, with that. You could take the same type of chassis if you wanted to. And that one, yep, okay. Instead of using the bevel gears, we could put the motor mounts on the bottom and mount the motors this way in order to do that on that chassis frame. So it's entirely up to you. What's gonna be one of the main differences? Well, this is gonna raise the center of the gravity of the robot, correct? However, it's also gonna enable me to have a little bit more clearance for the robot so that if I had to go up and down a ramp, right? I'd have a little bit more uh, wheel clearance or if I needed to clear an obstacle or if I wanted that extra height this way, right? Because I needed to place an object on top of another object and I wanted to have less lift mechanism. So these are also design, all design principles that you need to think of, okay, as you go forward with the different frames, right? Okay, you do wanna make sure that we, as we explained that when you do mount the motor mounts, okay, especially if you're gonna put them inside the channel like this, that the large hole is at the lower portion, okay? Therefore, it will stick out a bit at the top, 
but your large hole with the two close holes are to the bottom, okay, the bottom side of that U-channel. And that way you can put your motors in and you can mount the motors properly. If you don't, the motors aren't gonna fit, okay? They're gonna stick out the top of the channel and you're not gonna have that, them inside the channel like that going forward, all right? And it's a, a nice thing to do. You'll notice that as we talked about yesterday, um, when we're doing the mechanical design on here, that if I pop open uh, an Omni wheel, okay, that no matter what wheel design that you are going to do now with these hubs, it's integrated so that it's really nice. You can just pop on one, okay, and you put the plate on the other side. And if you needed to change wheels, okay, we could pop on the other wheel, right? this way you're right okay and then we can put the plate on the other side so the hubs make it nice and easy for you to switch and to come up with different design intent okay as you go forward um, as we stated with these ones you'll notice that we have two set screws in okay so that we can make sure that we're on that d shaft and we're not going to get um any slip at all all right and you know you might want to discuss with your students why we would use a round shaft, why we would use a D shaft. Um, I do have some uh, motors here that we use a hex shaft on, okay? But as I tell people, there's certain things that are gonna fail that are less expensive, and I'd rather have them fail than the more expensive part. So sometimes you can over torque the motor and fail the motor where I would rather have a hub come off a shaft because I can always just simply retighten that. So, you know, a lot of different designs um, that you can think about and you can do when you're going to put everything together, right? I'll uh, keep adding a couple more screws here and then we'll talk about the uh, mounting the motors, okay, onto the system. Okay. All, right. All right, so once you get everything lined up on a core chassis, you can then go and tighten it. But you can see from a quick design standpoint, it doesn't really take that long. Okay. And just to let everybody know that this is my actual very, very first time assembling with the new structure. And I uh, actually find it a lot easier. Pretty good. Good job, James. Okay. So, and we're from Canada, so, you know, I tend to call this the snowflake because of the pattern. And uh, it's actually snowing where I live right now, so it's apropos. How is that? All right. So once you get that all in, you will have in your collection, okay, your Studica driver and your wrench. You can put those on, and once it's all squared up, Remember that what you want to do is you want to tighten from opposite corners first, all right, to make sure that everything is, is snugged up. So I'm going to do all my opposite corners, all right, I'm going to square up my frame and run everything nice and straight, okay. And make sure you square up the frame on both sides when you're going to do this. Okay. And this is the type of thing that you want to go back through all the time. You know, after every run of your robot, you want to go back through and you want to make sure that everything is squared up. And that all of these screws are tight. We'll do one more. Put a laser on this and then we'll be okay. Whoop. So there's my core frame, 
I still need to put a few more um, socket and cap screws on that because I want four points of contact at each joint, right? And the reason is, is, is I can hear it, see what happens if you don't tighten them up, okay? Little bolts and nuts spin out and come loose. And that's just from me moving the chassis around uh, because we are using uh, kept nuts here, okay? So you want to always double check that and you want to make sure that everything is complete and everything is in place and it is. I just got some extra screws out, that's all. All right, and you should be good um, from each standpoint. Okay. okay, make sure you use the wrench. You can take those cap nuts and they will grab on the aluminum. So you can do it by hand the way that I'm doing it right here now, right? But you want to make sure that everything is completely secure right, at all times. All right, okay. Now, once you've got the frame put together, what you're gonna do is you're gonna mount the, your, it's your choice, right? But we really, really have to mount, if you think about it, the mounts to the frame before we are gonna mount the, um, mount the motors, right? So that we can see it, right? So we wanna see that as we go through uh, and we have a look at it, right? So we're gonna mount those motor mounts onto the frame um, the exact same way. We wanna make sure that we have access uh, for the channel and we're gonna mount them in the center. So you're gonna put your three assemblies together, right? And then you're gonna mount them on the center channel of the frame, okay? So we'll add that on to our frame. All right, and away we go. Uh, that was a weird question and I disagree. Okay. Who is that, Ashish? Yeah, I'll tell you why I disagree with you, Ashish, is I've assembled with the straight aluminum color, but this way when I'm assembling, I can actually see the fasteners easier and I can notice if the fasteners are loose. And that's one of the reasons why we have the darker channel is that that contrast in the difference, it actually enables me to see the holes easier, okay? And it enables me to see if I've actually got these mounted and in what hole pattern mounts they're in, right? So I, I actually find it a lot easier and I use straight unanodized or clear aluminum channel for a long time now, but I'm just, this is my first time with this and I can tell you right now that the darker color makes it easier for me to align the holes and it makes it easier for me to tell right away. I mean, I can look at that right away and I can say, I don't have enough fasteners in there. I, Derek said I need four. So right away, because it's not the same color, boom, 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 I know I've got a problem. If a fastener comes out of here, I know I've got a problem. So, you know, we didn't just think that blue was a great color. Uh, we did it for a reason, and that's one of the main uh, the main reasons that we did it. For. Right. So just a couple of points um, that are going to make this simpler for you. Uh, when you're going to do it. And remember that we had built a sample here so that we could show you. But just to make this easier when you're doing the assembly and to make sure that everything lines up, what I would do is I would be mounting the 48U channel first to the frame, okay? So take that 48U channel, I'll open one up here. And you'll see when you put that on, it's easier for me to mount that and to work with that okay, without having the motor end mount on there, okay, so that you could see that, all right, okay, so we just got a question about mounting the motor mount plate, okay, and the way that it should be mounted, so we'll let you, uh, oh, you got one here, there you go, so we'll switch over the camera, and we'll let you have a quick look at that. So if you look at the uh, motor mount plate, there are two holes at the top. 
this is for a different orientation for when you're mounting with the bevel gears. So what you want to do is these two holes here will meet the 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 top frame here. If you notice my uh, two holes up here, here's my channel. I'm going to slide it in like this. Now the two holes won't line up on the top because they're meant for a different mounting area. But you'll notice on the side here uh, that you have holes that line up here and here. And that's where you're going to screw in your holes for the motor mount. So essentially, it's going to be right on the end of the 48 channel. Got it. So this hole and this hole here will be on the end holes here and should be able to screw in pretty easily. Oh, I need my 40 to get back. I don't know if keep it in case we need it. All right. And then once you get all that on and all that lined up, you can pull out your DC motor, okay? And you will notice that. And what I'll do is we'll go back to the orientation over there so that you can see it. You can then take the DC motors, right? And you can mount them with into the frame, okay? Um, with the motor mount. Right? But it's better to mount before you right. put them in. Okay. If I really want to do it, the best way to do this is the way that James will show you here. He can show you on the other camera is it's going to be easier for you to work with it if you actually take the motor. What size do you want? 10 millimeter? So you use the 10 millimeter. Uh, not the soft head, the other one. The you one want, head? You want the button head? Okay. Right. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the, um, the 10 millimeter button head screw here. Okay. And we're going to use that to mount the motor. Um, to the frame. So I'll just show you the correct orientation. You'll find it a little bit easier if you mount the motor to the um, the motor mount plate, right? So take your Maverick motor, you're going to mount that to the motor mount plate, the 76140 first, and then you're going to put that into your 48 millimeter channel. It's just a little bit easier for you to work with. And it's technically the type of a sub assembly you can do, right? Because it's much, much easier for me to slide a motor in and out this way than it is to pull the motor out this way when I'm trying to fix a robot. So if you notice, there are six holes here on the motor mount plate, and then there's six holes on the gearbox of the motor. If you were to slide this right over, they would match the six holes on the gearbox. And it's preferable to use the button headed cap screw the uh, 10 millimeters. This is because it creates a low profile on the mount. So if I just slide that in there, you can see that I'll just be able to screw this in real easy. And I'm going to use a star pattern to create an even torque around the motor constraint. Derek only gave me four screws. However, there's uh, six mounting holes. Pudding, have some more screws. They're trying to clean up his workspace. So we'll grab two more screws here. So now the motor is mounted securely to the plate. As you can feel, you can't pull it off. You can see the mount, the motor is actually pretty strong onto the uh, plate. Now with this type of motor, this is the best way to mount the motor as you're actually connecting and screwing into the gearbox. So you're holding the motor at its strongest point. If you were to use the clamp mount and you hold it like this, what's happening is that you're not holding the mount, the motor securely. So if there's really strong torque, there could be a, 
a torsion in there and it can rotate when you don't want it to. Where with this type of mount, you're securely mounting it. There's no, there can't be any torsion because you're mounted straight to the gearbox. Now here's the 48U channel. As you can see, when it's mounted already to the robot, you can simply just slide it in, place the screws in, and it will become secure to the robot. And then if you needed to make any changes to the motor, you just have to remove those four screws. You could take the motor out easily, do any service that you need to the motor, put it back onto the plate, and then stick it back into the robot. So it makes it in general so much easier. Cool, okay. So we call those tips by James. I was just writing all this down, okay? So that I can create a weekly blog called Tips by James. And uh, then we'll put those out uh, for everybody to, uh, to see. So like James has said, once, uh, once everything is properly mounted, okay, then you can take your motor and you can put the motor in and it's easier to service because you can just put the, the screws along the side there, right? And it's a fairly strong structure this way, um, you know, because of the forces that we're doing with that motor mount, uh, you will not have an issue with any bending uh, or anything like that because all the weight is, or all the, the torque or the, the twisting, the dynamic and static forces are gonna be put through the frame of the robot, all right? So you wanna put all of that together, make sure you still have access to your wiring because we haven't done anything um, with either the power cables, right, or the uh, encoder cables yet uh, on these motors, right? And you're good to go. So you can get your frame together. And then once you get your frame together, what you're going to do is you're going to mount your Omni wheels onto that. And what we'll do is I'll get James to go back onto the small screen and just cover the Omni wheel mounting. I'll give him a, a little uh, hub and a plate, okay? And then we'll just cover that so that you can see how we're going to mount those Omni wheels onto that structure. It was here. Okay. So keep working on your stuff. I'm just going to grab my, uh, don't know what happened to it. I had it. And uh, we'll be good to go. So there's uh, inside each uh, mechanic wheel or omni wheel, there is a mount here. There are a couple sections to the mount. You have the back spacer, the shaft hub here, which has two set screws, which are loose right now. And then you have the retaining screw, which will screw the back plate to the mount. I forgot to bring a five millimeter for him, so I went and got one. I also brought my favorite tool that I would not use on the robot, but I may use on. So certain. I'm going to first install the set screws from the mount very gently. I'm not gonna screw them all the way in, otherwise I won't be able to get the motor shaft into the mount here. I'll zoom out. Okay. Now I'm going to place the hub onto the motor here. If you notice, I'm going to try and get one of the set screws to be on the flat side of the D shaft of the uh, motor. I'm going to slide it over like this. If you notice one thing, the hub will not slide all the way through. So I'm only going to mount it this far and then tighten it. What's nice with these mounts is you can tighten the hub without the wheel on it. And now I'm going to use the other side of the set screw to make sure that it's tight. And I'm now, the main hub is tight to the motor. As Derek was saying before, with these types of mounts, we can mount the Omni wheel like that, or we can mount the K 
cannon wheel the same way as they both use the same similar mount. Okay. So now on the Omni wheel, you'll see there's two sides. There's a flat side here, and then there's a side on the other side that's recessed. We want to use the recessed side for the mount, as you see, and then it'll just click in. You hear that snap, which means you're in. Now I can still spin this, even though I'm not spinning the motor. That's because we haven't uh, clamped this to the hub. That's what we use the spacer for. Spacer will then sit on the back here. We then put in the screw here on the back to retain them together. Spin by hand first to just get it in place. And then I'm going to use the nice M5 uh, drill bit here to drill in the screw. Now you might want to hold the wheel and the motor at the same time while tightening to prevent the wheel from spinning. Now that it's tight, the wheel and the motor are together and should be good to go. Back to there. All right, so you can continue building uh, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna mount the um, motors and the wheels hub assembly, or the sub assembly together if you want. Uh, you can do them all separately the way James did. Then you can just slide them in and you can mount them to your frame, all right? And when you're done mounting them to the frame, uh, what you'll get is you'll get a three-wheel drive holomic robot. All right. So that's my frame. Uh, haven't mounted the wheels up yet. I've got one here. We got our prototype on there. Okay. So when you're done, what you'll do is you'll get a base um, square frame. Okay. Now, a couple of things. We're a little bit um, fancy here. Everybody's orientation is going to be a little bit different and the way that people lay out their electronics can be different as well. Um, so, you know, if you need to mount your stuff on top, you can take your kit and you can run um, some of the beams across and put some plates on until you get a good design finalized. All right. In, in our case here, what we've done is we've just taken a little bit of um, uh, plastic polycarbonate plastic sheet or acrylic actually, sorry. Okay. We cut it out on the laser, so we just matched the whole pattern, and then we decided uh, what we want to mount and how we want to put that on the robot, okay? Back to yesterday, when I talked about the rules uh, and going forward into Shanghai, was we talked about you would be able to bring um, some components. How much and how you don't um, is still to be determined, but one of the things that you can bring uh, that we had talked about would be you would be able to bring some some cut Lexan material and this is or cut acrylic material and this is one of the the reasons for it right is so that you can do little mounts all right we also do this by the way to prototype new components that's the way that it works so you'll notice on this robot that my battery mounts here are made out of the uh, uh, plastic the acrylic okay but you know lo and behold all of a sudden when they show up inside of a kit they're actually made out of aluminum, right? So a lot of this stuff gets added um, and changed as we go forward. Uh, if you need help with anything, you let us know. We'll, we'll send you some CAD files or designs, okay, whatever you need to do. But at this point, we're just prototyping. Um, so the way that we mount those electronics um, can be done whatever you want. You could put one on a small, one of the plates that are there, maybe put a beam across and mount a plate on top of that and then set everything there. If you're not sure where you're going to mount your batteries right now, okay, uh, because of weight distribution, how you want to work on those batteries, you know, just put them on top of a piece of channel and I use a tie strap and I tie them on, right? Because then I have the ability to cut the tie straps, move the batteries around um, and change those locations going forward, all right? 
So that'll give you a, a base frame. I'm not sure what frame we're going to use or, or uh, program uh, later on on Friday when we show you. We'll probably use this one, right? Or, or anything, but we're just trying to give you some different ideas here um, of what you can do. All right. Okay. So the next thing we, we're going to talk about um, before we get into the wiring, um, and you know, you have a couple of days to uh, to build this. Can I bring this over? Power off or on? On. Okay. All right. Okay. So what we do for training, and in order to um, to get through with the coding and how we are going to do this, what we do, and I've given you a sample um, CAD file that you can actually look at, is we take some channel and we build what we call a, a training platform. So in the perfect world, and I would encourage this, is that what you want is you want you want one of these in your classroom for every two students. How's that? And we'd be more than happy to, to help you do that and uh, and put that together uh, so that you can see it. All right. Um, so in this case, what I've done is I've just got two uh, of the 288 channel, right, and two of the 144 channel that we've gone to build a base frame structure. Okay, uh, we on this case had cut uh, a piece of uh, plastic acrylic for the top as well to mount our structure on. Um, you know, we want to train and practice here. What you can do is put some standoffs on and just put a couple of plates there, right, on top so that you can see it. We like to teach a few different concepts as well. Uh, so in this case, what we've done to show you is we added a, a you know, a low cost breadboard to the top of it. Um, just in case we wanted to prototype something that we were working on. Because we use this a lot for our prototyping and design. So before we design a component that we add to the collection, we actually put that there, right? So with our electronics here, what we've done is we just put the frame together, the battery in our case, okay? The battery is underneath on one side so that we can see it. Um, on the other side, we've used the standard motor mount. So we just use the, the over clamp on motor mount here and we have mounted a motor to it, all right? Then very, very simple on the front of the channel for uh, training, what we've done is right here, we've taken the, the ultrasonic distance sensor and mounted it, okay? On this side, so the sensors are together, we took the sharp IR sensor and we mounted that from that uh, hardware standpoint, okay? We mounted a servo on this side, so we just took one of the front servo mounts and mounted that there as well, okay? Sorry, my phone's going off. And it's about training curriculum and half of it has to do with this, so it's good. Uh, we took an uh, inside L channel here, and we've, we've 3D printed a mount for our camera, okay? And we put that there so that we can plug our camera in for the system, right? The line sensor board, we took another angle channel, we mounted the line sensor board on the bottom. So we've got all of the sensors right now um, in the collection that are currently mounted to the frame. There's the analog to the ADC on the top that we talked about. And we're gonna cover this um, after the next break with the wiring as we go through the wiring for this. And then simply on the top, we've mounted the VMX, okay, and the Titan. So this is what we do for, for a training platform. So this way, without building a robot, I can sit down, we can discuss the different components that are here within the, within the system. And it makes it nice and easier for, for us because we can show you the wiring. And that's also a reason why we put a clear sheet on the top so that I can see through it and I can look at the wiring. Because even on this side, okay, James has mounted both the servo power block, okay? And he's actually got the servo programmer mounted here so that he can show you how to use the servo programmer. So that he's got that stuck on this side for it. And then the camera is there with that cable that we talked about yesterday. And he's got it all nice and tidied up as well. So everything's tie strapped together um, so that nothing pulls apart, right? 
So this is a, another type of thing that you can uh, put together and you can do. Uh, you will have in your system, and I'll just show it to you. Let me just close this off. I'll show you the screen just so that you can see it. So for, for programming, if you don't want to build uh, any form of robot going forward for Thursday and Friday, all right, what you can do is you can build this, uh, this training platform. You can have it handy. You don't have to worry about it exactly. You just want to make sure that you've built a frame or a structure that you can generally mount all of the components to, and you need to make sure that you have access to all of the components okay for when we do the wiring and you can have a look at it so i'll just call up the cad file and we'll have a look at it so that you can see what we've got um, it'll come up we will give you the cad files uh, in today's sessions uh, so that you can uh, you know put these together and test them as you go forward right. it's taking a while for this to uh to pop up and then we'll go through it I don't see any questions in the chat, so I think we're we're pretty well okay on the on a frame. Um, I'm not concerned what type of frame you want to build. If you want to try to build a square frame, um, build a square frame. If you want to put the motor mounts on the top or on the bottom, um, feel free to do that as well. Just remember those basic rules about where to put the fasteners. Use your full fasteners, okay? How the mounts go and how you are going to tighten everything together. Um, and have a look at that going forward, right? Um, I'll just call this up. It's still converting everything over from the step file because I'm using Autodesk Inventor. Okay, it's the one file I forgot to save. And uh, then, what's that? It's almost over. It's okay, we can race. James is gonna race, got a fast computer. Let's see what happens. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go, All right. Sorry, more RAM, little computer, big computer. Tablet. Size matters, is that it? Tab Tablet, okay. Well, I'll let him open it up and he can share his screen then because mine's still opening and he can take you through uh, the way that it was put together and assembled, right? It's, I think his is already open. Yep. There you go. Okay, so he'll share his screen and he can take you through what I was going to take you through and have a have a look at it. So here we have the trainer itself. Uh, and you can see all the base channel here. Uh, here you have the sharp sensor, the ultrasonic sensor, as Derek showed. There's the motor here with the motor clamp, the Omni wheel. I mounted the line sensor a bit differently in the CAD than it is in real life. Um, then you have the servo with its mount. Here is the servo power block so that we can power the servo. Now the battery is not shown here because it wasn't really important for the CAD. And on the top plate you have the VMX, the Titan, here's a little breadboard to show. You have the analog module. Here's the camera. As you can also see in the uh, top acrylic plate, there are holes here. These holes allow for the cables to flow through to be mounted to the electronics on the top. And then on the back here, there's a slit that's right here. This allows for the motor cable to flow through and then be plugged into M2. As you can see is what it is right here. It comes right through the slot here and plugs in. Yeah. And in all, it's a pretty simple design just for 
showing off all the components in the kit, well, electronic and sensor wise. And it's a good way to test the robot. If there's anything wrong, you can check to make sure that your code's working with a specific sensor, a motor, or you just want to test your vision. You can just put this there and test your vision. Okay. Yeah, so fundamentally, if you stop sharing that, we'll go back in a minute. I mean, fundamentally, fundamentally, the idea behind this, and I, and I, I get it, you know, ideally, this is in the, the perfect world. Um, you should all have at least 20 or 50 robots. That's the perfect world. Um, but what we do with the training platform is that if we're working on the robot um, sub-design system, we have that. Um, we always, I tell people when you're designing for robotics, take a look at the task, start and do two things really well. All right. I mean, I had a guy here yesterday, we we're talking about a robotics competition and he says, all oh, my competitors want to do this, this, and this, we're going to do it right away. And I said, you know, stop. Okay. And if I go back to the last uh, competition and I could use the example that, you know, his competitors wanted to pick up all 18 balls at once. Right. But they hadn't even learned how to pick up one yet. So I said, why don't you do one task? Well, which is, pick up one object, deliver it to the carrier, move that one carrier object, okay, from the component area to the delivery area, right? And that's actually three tasks. Do that and do it really well and have that designed and then go back and try to do the next thing, all right? Don't, don't reach for the stars uh, when you're below the ground. So yeah, that, that's, that's, one of, that's a Murphyism, okay? Uh, so in this case, what we do is we can work on the robot system, but then somebody doing coding, somebody practicing systems, they can test their sensors, they can test their functionality, all right? As James said, they can test their vision um, and they can do all sorts of different things. So if you wanna just not build the robot platform right now, the reason that we showed you this in the hardware build is it, it gets you experience with the hardware, but then it's a quick, easy way for you as we get into coding these, you'll quickly be able to put some code onto the system and test the servo or test the ultrasonic or test the sharp IR, you know, so what you guys can do later today is build yourself a little test jig. All right. And you're good to go. And when we do coding, you don't have to worry about having a whole robot um, system to worry about uh, when you are going to work through that. Okay. So just another point when we uh, upload the files for today, there will be the triangle robot CAD files, the training system CAD files. There'll be the U channel that I just showed you, um, which is a square frame, and that can be adapted for both the bevel drive where you have the motors inside of the hardware frame, or if you want, you can mount them underneath, okay, using the 48 millimeter uh, channel and the motor mount plate, or you can mount them underneath if you want, if you're used to it using the same type of motor mounts before. So you have a lot of flexibility in your designs and you can put together um, anything that you wish to do. What we're gonna do going forward to show you the coding um, and how the whole thing goes together is we're gonna use our training platform because it just makes it easier for us because we're not going to this side of the robot or this side of the robot. We can show you everything in one compact platform, how a sensor works, how the camera works um, and so on as we go through. Okay. All right. Um, 9.55. Um, we'll take another break because I'm on my fourth coffee. And yeah, we'll move that over when we get going. And uh, what we'll do is we'll come back. Let's, let's give you 15 minutes um, like we did the last time. Uh, we'll come back at 10 after 10. Uh, and then we're just going to discuss the electrical system. Okay. And the wiring. All right. Okay. Great. Have a good break.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm uh, I'm ready. Look at this. See, two cups of coffee. We're all good to go, and uh, I'm happy. James has a hot chocolate, so he's good. Um, so we're going to spend the last uh, little bit about today talking about the um, the electrical system um, and some wiring. Uh, your choice, James. Will talk about the cable packs, um, what's in them, how they're used, um, especially to explain specifically what's in the VMX cable pack and why the little adapter boards are there and what each cable does as it's going forward. And then also the Titan cable pack, what you get with the cables, all right? You should be able to um, have enough in there to take your robot and wire up a robot and get some motors moving and so on, uh, because we are now um, pre-cabling a lot of stuff for you, right? There still may be occasions or just because you want to, um, you know, where you're gonna customize your cable lengths, right? Um, all the electrical engineers will know all about EMF and the longer the cable runs are and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, that type of stuff we cover, uh, like I said, in the, in the full, uh, full curriculum. Um, and I actually have a meeting about that as, as soon as this is done because some of the writers um, that we have have just arrived. So, you know, we got a lot of options for you if you want. We use on our motors and our electrical connections um, Anderson Power Pole. We do have um, crimpers and kits available uh, that we can get to you so that you can actually put those together um, and use them. So, you know, whatever you want to use, uh, you can sit down and, and put together. Um, but as I said on day one, electrical wiring is critical. It tends to be the number one reason why people have problems, right? And for those of you that were at our test competition in China last year, and you remember that one robot that just kept stopping on the court all the time. And when we turned it over, we found one little strand of wire that as the robot had gone over bumps, okay, was grounding out to the frame. And that would short out the whole system and it would have to restart and start to run again, okay? So, you know, this is the number one cause of failures is poor wiring and poor wiring management. So we, we've tried to, um, reduce that fault for you. You know, we're providing cables that have the power pole connectors now on one side and you can plug those right in. Okay. And in this case, we have two pin JST on the other side and you can plug those right in. So lots of wires, the correct gauge of wires uh, and so on for you. So I will pass this over to James to talk about the, uh, the wire packs and then we'll go over and how we've wired up the individual training system. Mm -hmm and where all the connections are. Okay, you can do whatever you want in, in whatever order you want. I'm easy to get along with today, which is strange for me. So I'm gonna need you to take the, this away and put it back. Got it. James has got, he's, he can't lift anything. He's got a cracked rib. So we're not quite sure how you get a cracked rib typing on a keyboard, but no, he does a lot more than that. So we'll just move this out of the way for him so that he can get going. You want to show that this too? Uh, no. Okay. Can you do that later. All right. Let's try to zoom in better here. Let's zoom. So, in each collection, there are two packs. There's a VMX wire cable pack, and then there's the Titan cable pack. Each of these will allow you to wire up most of the stuff on your robot. If we look at the Titan cable pack first, Gonna open it up. Inside, you will find a really long CAN cable. I think it's uh, three meters. No, no, it's not three meters. No, it's about three feet. No, four or five. It's a meter. It's yeah, a meter. About Sorry. That long. Yeah, it's pretty long. You most likely will not need the full length, so you can use a wire stripper to cut it. So this cable is used to go between the VMX and the Titan. It's two CAN ports. As you can see, the CAN port here and then the CAN port here. The CAN port is labeled. I'm not sure if you can see in the screen here where it says a high yellow and then low green. That, of course, matches the color of the cable. Makes it easy to wire. 
And by the way, the green and yellow is an industry standard. So you are learning something. Oh, I've learned something today. Yeah. Then of course, there are two JST VH to VH cables, as you can see here. They're 50 centimeters long and you get two of them. There are two ports on the Titan that these come in. They simply just click in and you can pull the tab to unclick. So one cable should be used to power the VMX through its JST VH cable uh, connector port, which will plug directly into here. And then the other port is used for your servo power block, which also has a VH connection. And you'll plug the other port into here. Pretty simple. Thanks. Then we have the VMX cable pack. Inside the VMX cable pack, there are a lot of cables and a few adapter boards. So the first cable here is a VH cable with no connection on the one end. This is for if you wanted to create your own type of power to wire whatever. And as all the other ones before, it plugs directly into the port here and then can be unplugged by clicking the tap and pulling up. Right. The point here would be that that's if you're going to power the VMX on its own or you want to do custom power, because remember that in the robot control system, you're going to come from the Titan, okay, to the VMX with the other JST cable, and that's how you're going to power the VMX. The main reason why we do power the VMX from the Titan is it then connects the two ground sources to prevent any issues with communication. We also then have a JST VH to wall wart adapter. What this does is it allows you to use an external uh, AC jug jack from your wall. Make sure that your the voltage going into here is 12 volt DC and has at least three amps of current. So it's 12 volts, three amps output going into here. There's plenty of those to find. I'm pretty sure you can find it locally. It's a normal DC jack and you can just go click. The main benefit to this cable is that you can power your VMX in order to do your vision processing. So when you're testing all your vision code or you're just writing code to deploy to here. But the big issue is you want to have this plugged in for when you're doing vision as vision can take a long time to program and get right. And you don't want to keep on charging batteries and then discharging them while running, then charging them then while running, especially because a fully discharged battery will take up to four hours to charge. Put that to the side. Then you have four JST GH to JST GH cables. So you can see here, they're also 50 centimeters long. These cables plug into the JST GH ports here on the side of the VMX. See, we have the COM ports and then we have the flex DIO ports. The pinouts for the flex DIO ports are actually silk screened onto the VMX. The COM ports here, you can look it up on the docs page. And these will only connect one way into the port here. For example, if I wanted to go into the UART port, which is the middle one here in the COM ports, I can then just stick it in and it clicks right in. And then just like all the other connections, there's a tab that you pull, which can then allow you to release the cable. Then inside this bag, There is an adapter board. 
What the adapter board does is it takes the GH cable, which plugs into the GH port here, and then converts it to a four pin DuPont connector or a standard 2.54 header, which will then allow you to hook up encoders or any external jumper cable that you're using for your system. For example, if I wanted to use my ultrasonic sensor with the flex the IO ports here, I would have to plug it into here and then use this cable into the flex the IO. Oh, excuse me. That hurt. <laughs> hurt his rib there. Okay. And that's it for the VMX cable pack. Okay. Now, just one point about the CAN cable that I'll talk about, because we talked about wire preparation in my very, very last slide yesterday. I talked about it. Um, but you'll notice that it is kind of long, and on the stripped ends, when they're clean, they've been stripped, um, and then there's a bit of solder on them, okay, so that they do not uh, do not fray. So if you do cut that shorter, I suggest that you do the same thing, because then when you go to put that through and and put it into those connectors, okay, for the can, you're not going to get any any fraying wires or any short on there, okay. So just a quick little tip and trick um, on doing your wiring to make sure that everything's okay. You want that cable back? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we'll put the training unit back because we can see all the wiring on it. Is that good? Yeah. I'm squared up. Okay. Then I'm going to put this in the MX cable pack back together. Yeah. Are we switching this to a unified cable? Yeah. Okay. So if we look at the training platform here, we have the Titan and the VMX. You can see there is a, there's the CAN cable that's going along here, which go into the CAN port here, and then the CAN port on the Titan. It's, as you can see, it's a nice short wire. It doesn't need to be long. I'm not using the full length of the wire. If I was using the full length of the wire, in general principle, it would take longer for the signal to get from here to there. Therefore, theoretically, it's slower. However, at this cable length, we wouldn't get that. But in theory, in industry, you'd want to have the shortest cable possible in order for the communication to be stable and fast. So that's why it's being stripped and is as short as possible. Here we have the power cable from the Titan going to the power in of the VMX. As you can see, I've twisted the cable here because we give a 50 centimeter long cable to power the difference. Normally, the VMX and Titan might be on separate sections of the robot. So you this length would be appropriate. However, you could always custom make your own JSC VH cable to be the right length as is recommended, as you are allowed to bring your cable in, into world skills, as we always have allowed that because teams like to do their own cabling. Then as we can see here, this is the power cable going into the Titan. This cable then routes through to the power switch here which also goes to the battery in the back. The power switch that's located on the, this training platform is actually the power switch from the World Skills Junior robot. However, you can use any power switch you want. There is a power switch in the World Skills kit that you can pop out and create your own play and use as well. Or you can mount the actual panel to this and use that if you wanted as well. So that's for the power to here. Then there's one last power port, which is located here. This goes underneath through the, the slotted hole here and then goes to the, I don't know if you can see it here, the servo power block. So this. You want me to tilt it up? No, it's okay. okay. To power this, which can then power 
the servo on the front. The reason why we have the servo power block is that the VMX only has a 500 milliamp output for its uh, output, and you can't drive a servo with that amount of voltage and current. So we created the servo power block to take power from the Titan. And then with that, we can power the servos with the correct six volt voltage, and they have the 10 amps of current to work with which means we can be driving our servos at their full torque all the time when it's needed. Then on the top here, we also have the camera. Right now the camera is in a 3D printed case so that it's isolated from the environment, nothing can touch it. We have the HDMI cable. In this case, we have a micro HDMI cable, which is the new design of the camera, which is not being released yet for the collection, but this will be the version that will be at World Skills. There is no difference between this version and the full HDMI version, which is currently in the kit. The only difference is the cable is a bit smaller now in uh, width, because you know a normal HDMI is a thicker cable. And then the cables then run through to the uh, connector here to bring it to the ribbon cable. We are currently designing a case for this section to sit up on top of the VMX case to allow for more rigidity so that there's no flex here or chance to break the ribbon cable. However, you can also design your own if you want, which is the beauty of 3D printing. And it's allowed inside the competition. There's also the analog module here the reason the analog module was created as there is only four analog ports on the VMX itself. And if you can do math, there are two sharp sensors and one Cobra sensor in the collection. The Cobra sensor has four analog sensors on it. These four analog sensors plus the two sharps add up to six. So that means we are two extra analog inputs short. So we created the Cobra, I mean the analog module here, which interfaces directly with the Cobra. If you were to take a six pin cable and you plug it into the Cobra, you can then take that same six pin cable and just go bam, right into the analog module. The analog module, if you look at it, it's very simple. You have the header here, and then there's a jumper here that is for the pull-up resistors on the ITC bus. We have it pre-installed. If it's not communicating, you can take the jumper off, which will turn off the pull-ups. However, that's not required as from our testing, we found that it's fine. There's a JST SH connector here, which is the same connector as the quick uh, spark fun sensor system which makes it available for that system if you're doing an offline or different competition from world skills. There's a specific cable that comes with the uh, analog module, which will go from the JST SH to the JST GH and plug directly into the VMX. You can see the cable right here. And then we have the line sensor at the bottom here and you can see that cable is being flown through into the analog mode. On the analog module, you will notice there will see a VCC and ground port. The VCC and ground port is if you want to add an external voltage or ground connection to the analog module to power more current or a different voltage to the uh, sensor that you're using. If you end up doing that, you have to cut the power pin on the GH cable. So that's the red wire on the GH cable. You're just going to cut it to prevent that voltage from being sent through to the VMX, which could cause some issues. And then, of course, we have the breadboard for if you wanted to do any sort of prototyping, for example, you can put in an LED here or try and use a limit switch. 
with the VMX, we're just outputting a simple thing. As this is a training platform, that's why it's there for added curriculum benefits. If I were to slowly tilt this upwards. Okay. So here we have the ping, the ultrasonic sensor. So if you can sort of see here at the back, we have the cables that are then flowing through up into the port here on, which is the flex DIO port on the VMX. The reason why we use the flex DIO port for the ultrasonic sensor, as we are doing an in and out communication. So we need to be able to send and receive back data. And then we have the sharp IR sensor, which flows through up through the same area here, as you can see the cables here, and then goes to the analog port on the VMS. Now, what, what we'll do for you is, um, is uh, later on when we're done, is we're going to pull away the, the front of what you see here, and we'll actually just take a quick picture of that, and we'll try to label each wire, and we'll send that out um, with the documentation uh, this afternoon, just so you can see what pin um, each end of the cable is actually plugged into, okay? And we'll make that nice and simple uh, and easy for you. And here we have the motor. Of course, the motor flows through back into that slotted M2 slot back here, along with the encoder cable as well. I'll show that again when we flip it back over. We have the servo here. So you can see I put one of the horns that come with the servo on it just to show it spinning. And then we have the Cobra sensor here. I'm just using an inside L bracket to prop the sensor up. I place two, uh, two millimeter spacer in between the mounting ports there to prevent the sensor from touching the channel. Because if it were to touch the channel, it would short the sensor because the pins from the sensor will be touching the channel and therefore the five volts of the sensor will be making contact with the ground and that will short the sensor. If we look on the side here, here we have the servo power block and the programmer. So what would happen is if I turn on the robot, you would see the lights turn on here However, I've disconnected this. I just need to plug in the one cable and then you'd have power back to this. And what that does is the servo plugs into the power block here. And then we have another cable, as you can see back here, which will route through and it comes up and plugs into one of the PWM ports on the VMX so that we can then control the servo. If I wanted, right now the servo is configured in standard mode. If I wanted to change it to continuous mode, I would then have to use the programmer. You don't have to put the programmer on your robot. The reason why it's here is that it's, that we always have a programmer for the training platform in order to change it to a continuous or standard servo rotation that we don't need to show it outside or we forget it for training, it's always there. And in this case, we don't have to change the servo from one output slot to a different output slot. And we would be able to configure the motor and then change the slot back to the previous slot. And we don't even have to change anything on this side as it's now using a different connection. So if we look here, you can see the motor being plugged into the Titan, along with the encoder cable that comes with the Titan, plugging into the encoder port that's matching the motor. There's a silk screen on the Titan. Hold up the Titan here so we can see better. So if you look at the silk screen, the encoder is the bottom port, which is the four pins at the bottom. There is a pinout, as you can see, there's plus A minus B. That matches the cables that are coming here, where you have the red cable being your plus, the blue cable being your A, 
the black cable being ground, which is your minus, and then the yellow cable being your B, as we are using quadrature encoders, so you have an A and B signal. If I were to now turn on the trainer, you can see the status lights blinking on the Titan. Right now it's blinking blue. That's because it does not have the proper communication between the controller and the VMX. And now you can see that it's changed color between blinking blue, where now it blinks blue, red, and green. What this means is that now there is communication between the Titan and the VMX through the CAN bus, and the robot is disabled. What this means is that the motors won't move, the servo won't move. You can still get sensor feedback. However, there'll be no actuated functions happening. This is for safety reasons, so that the robot won't move or do anything sporadic when it's not supposed to. When the robot becomes enabled, this will switch to blinking purple, which then means the robot is live, and the motors will then be enabled, and the servos will be enabled in that for that they can move. Yeah, so just a, a quick point on this is that as we get through for the rest of the week, um, and we, we cover the programming. Um, this is a, a little bit new um, for a lot of people in the past. What you did was you would download your code to the real device and technically the robot um, was live, okay? Um, now, before you can run the robot, um, you'll have to actually um, enable it, okay? So we have an interface that enables you to do that now. Um, so we just added an extra level of safety there uh, and we will make sure that we go through uh, and, uh, and, sh and show that to you so that you understand um, what you must do before your robot will actually um, run code, okay? Um, what we'll also do is that when we're going to do each sensor on Thursday um, and show you the programming for it, we'll break each sensor down and make sure that you can clearly see um, if you have some difficulty with it exactly what pin we're using and where each one of those cables is plugged in. Um, we'll take a few um, pictures later today, like I said, and I'll, I'll blow them up and we'll be able to see those, okay? Uh, just so you know where, where you're going to plug everything in as a good example. Uh, one thing to note, this blinking status light here is not the status light for your robot, which means you will have to be activating a separate status light to uh, satisfy the CID? Competitor information document, yeah. yes. So if there's a separate light um, that is required, because uh, Bob has it, the, the safety light, um, the best way to do that is probably with the LED, right? Um, we have the LED uh, output, um, and that can meet that uh, requirement for you, okay? So that light is strictly the status of the communication system. You're still going to need to um, to program a light. Whether you do that through the LED or you need to remember that the power panel, okay, has um, the three switches on it. So you could actually do that through the switches on the power panel. There's also the two LEDs on the power panel. Right, and there's also two LEDs on the power panel um, that could fit that requirement as well. Okay, so that's just one thing for you to uh, to look at. So. Yeah. This light's just for safety to show what the motor controller's current state is. Right. Okay, and that's basically everything wired up on the robot. It's very simple now, as it's mostly just plug and plug. The only real custom cabling that's being done on this robot has been the power. For custom length with the power cables and crimping of the PWM, I mean, that's on the power poles themselves like this, and crimping to the power switch and the battery. As Derek showed with the, the, with the crimper. Oh, yeah. The crimper then allows you to create that custom cabling for the power itself, which is always recommended because the shorter and thicker gauge that you have, 
the more power that's going to the robot. So in this case, we just used the simple power pull crippler. And of course, when you order your kits, you can ask to have one of these put in along with other power poles. As we've heard in the past that some countries struggle to uh, get access to power poles. It's very easy for us here and we can simply put it into your kit when you buy it. Right, okay. So um, what I'm just gonna do is, uh, when we do break this out, because the sensor cables now, um, you'll notice that on the, when we do the flex DIO, for instance, here, right? You'll see that we have, uh, we have three pins, right? So sharp's fairly easy because we have three pins on the sharp, okay? But your little wiring diagrams and it's covered in the docs page. The ends of the cables now for all the sensors, they're split. So they will enable you to plug in and use the various ports. So like I said, what I will do later is we'll take a picture here and then we'll take a picture here of each sensor so that you can see the, the samples that we're going to wire this up. And we'll verify this. We can't tell you which way you need to wire your robot. That's entirely up to you. But when we go to do the sample code, for instance, for the Sharp IR or for the ultrasonic distance sensor, we will verify the picture with you of the way that we have this wired up. So what we'll do is we'll use our training platform, but we'll also then take this and say, okay, for this one, this is where it's wired on here. And what we'll do is we'll post that um, after this session so that if you're wiring stuff up, you can see the exact same way that we have it wired up. Okay, so I'll plug them all in. I'll hold the ping. We'll snap a picture here, and then we'll do the same, or the sharp, or the ultrasonic. Sorry, and then we'll do the same thing with each other sensor um, and where they're all plugged in for you. Okay. Is that it? Oh, we're all these early ones. Okay. Um, last thing I just want to confirm with you is that we talked about what the very first session here is charging your batteries. Okay. So remember, there's your 0.9 amps right there. And that's the setting that I currently have this on. That's the setting you want to charge your batteries on. If you flip that over to fast charge, okay, to 1.8 amps, um, what's going to happen is it's going to charge your batteries, but it's not going to run a slow trickle charge uh, to them. You're going to lose battery life in the long run. So this is your emergency charge only. Okay, make sure that you're on that uh, 0.9 amps is what you want to be charging those batteries on on a regular basis, okay? So I just wanted to make sure that everybody uh, everybody has that information. Uh, I doubt you'll follow the rule I just told you. Your competitors won't follow the rule. Um, that's great because you can buy more batteries then. Uh, it'll be the, the simple um, fact of the matter when you're going to do it. Okay, so... It's, um, it's 1045. Uh, we're actually done uh, for the day. We're always done on this day a, a couple of days early. It all depends how long I make you build um, and put things together, okay? We will uh, post later today, once the recording is compiled, we'll take those pictures and we will put the, uh, the share up as well. Now, remember that when we do the share, it's based, I believe, upon the emails you registered with, okay? So if you registered with some strange email and you're wondering why you're not getting access to everything, um, that's the reason why, okay? So let's just make sure that uh, if you're having difficulty, um, contact us or contact Frank, because I think he was the contact person for the registration, and we will make sure that you get added to that share um, so that you can begin to, uh, to put everything together um, so that we can get on. Uh, tomorrow, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about uh, Java. Right, I believe we're just going to do um, core Java. If you think you are um, a Java expert already, uh, you're free we to. Might be, we're still, no, we're still going to program. The robot. Okay, we're still going to program the robot um, on our introductory Java. Um, so we're going to get we're going to just keep forging ahead and see how much we can do um, as we go. But if you've never programmed um, in Java before, we'll give you a quick uh, introduction to it. Uh, and we're going to follow James's rules for programming with Java, okay? Because uh, he has his own rules, especially with brackets. So uh, we'll make sure that we're covered. 
So uh, we finished 15 minutes early today. Uh, I'd like to thank, oh, we got a couple of, we're gonna sit here if you got any more um, questions, okay? And uh, you- So for Sheldon, uh, we are only providing training in Java. However, C++ is fully good to go. And you'll get sample code um, in C++ as well. So when you get the sample Java code on the docs page, there's a C++ tab. There's a C++ tab as well. Okay, but uh, you know we decided for the training that rather than try to do multiple language, is we'll just we'll just stick with one. Yeah, I can actually show. It. Yeah. Okay, and what will he'll show you the what's there so you can see it. So if we look at the docs page and we go to, let's say, for example, the Cobra sensor. So here it talks about the Cobra, its electrical characteristics, how you need to plug into there. And then you can see the programming here. There is a Java tab, which shows code used for Java. And then if you swap over to C++, there is the code for the C++. So the training itself will be Java orientated, but the C++ is always there for those that want to use C++. Right. Okay. Same things there for, here's the ultrasonic sensor. There's the code for Java and here's the code for C++. Right. So we'll, uh, we'll go over that. Uh, we'll get that all uh, posted for you. And you'll be ready to go. So, uh, so, so both both are perfectly fine. Uh, obviously, the C plus plus is the lower level, so it will be that little bit more memory efficient and faster. However, there is no real difference between the Java or C plus plus in the long range of uh, performance. Right. So that question was: Would you recommend Java or C plus plus for the for the platform? Okay, so that's what uh, what James has just uh, answered. You know, it's it's up to you so that uh, so that you can see it. Um, no, you have to manually enable the robot uh, every time it's turned on. Okay, and we will be showing that in a later day. Right. Maybe tomorrow we can show it how the robot how you manually enable the robot. Right. Okay. So the question was, will the robot enable itself each time it is turned on? Okay. Uh, no, it will not. So what you have to do is you have to manually enable the robot. We have a functionality built into the new control system and software programming to do that. Okay. It's also great because it will provide some feedback to the competitors so that they, they will understand, but it's more um, for a safety reason. And the fact is that uh, you're gonna have to enable it with a, we'll show you how to do it, don't worry. Um, and then you will be able to run the code, okay? So that's that's what you've gotta do. So there's also a couple of other reasons for that um, in the long run. And that is that we will be able to control um, eventually when robots can be turned on and when robots can be turned off okay um within the within the envi competition environment all right so that's one of the reasons for it all right so uh someone asked in the q a the platform already supports ros uh it is raspberry pi based so there it's a raspberry and image uh we currently don't have an ros node however if your country or team wanted to create its own ros node you're perfectly free to go and do so. Okay, so as I said on day one, there's a question here about LabVIEW. LabVIEW is not officially supported with this platform, okay? Um, there are some teams and countries who are using LabVIEW, but it will have limited functionality um, using this platform. So right. essentially what it comes down to is if you choose to use LabVIEW, uh, we can't give you the direct support that teams using Java and C++ will have. 
of course we will attempt to help you, but we can't help as much as we don't officially support it. Right. But this year, you're, you can use whatever language you want, but the supported languages are Java and C++. Like if you want to use Python, for example, you can go ahead and use Python. However, we won't be able to support it. Right, okay, because we're writing libraries for certain languages and testing for certain languages um, as we go forward. Um, our priority was um, Java and C++. Why? Because they're widely used and they don't cost a lot of countries any additional funds, okay? And as soon as those are completed and done and we have a little more testing to do on one of the Java C++ functions, um, then we will be starting to ask the question or to answer the question. Um, we laid out framework actually last night um, for the VMX ROS node to start that at our end as well. So Sheldon asked, what's your preferred language, Java or C++? For me, it's Java because I did Java in school, so I'm very proficient in Java. However, if you did C++ in school, you'd probably be more proficient towards C++. Yeah. The actual library for the Titan is written in C++, and then it uses a Java abstraction layer for the Java side. So if you're using C++, you bypass that layer, and that's where the certain extra functions come in of the benefits of C++. However, I would, I would program my robot in Java because that's what I'm used to. And we always recommend program the robot in the language you are most used to it. Yeah, so if you're more used to C++, then you should use C++. That's great, but I, I can't tell you, uh, Sheldon, what your competitors would be more um, familiar with, right? So they may have used Java um, all throughout school because it's taught generally in 80% in of, the, of the classes, right? And that's one of the reasons why we, we looked at it and started with it. Um, we spent two years surveying countries and surveying experts and uh, you know that was what most people were teaching um, and that's sort of what we focused on. Will the hardware be programmed using cable connection or not? So uh, to program or connect to the uh, VMX Pi, the VMX creates its own wireless access point. So you're actually using direct Wi-Fi to communicate with the VMX. However, you can also use an ethernet connection to connect and program the VMX. And yes, once connected via a wireless or ethernet, you can SSH or VPN in very easily. Yeah, All right. We're gonna do uh, one way. Um, after that, you can pretty well do whatever you want. Yeah, the preferred method is definitely to use it in Wi-Fi mode as but that's the way all the scripts and stuff set up are programmed to be more beneficial on the VMX. Okay. And we'll be going through that uh, later, maybe a little bit tomorrow, but more Thursday and Friday. Right. So that question was, will the hardware be programmed using cable connection to laptop or will it be connected through SSH and VPN? Okay. Um, the, the answer is we're going to focus now on the uh, on the wireless connection because it is a direct one-to-one -one wireless connection. We have had absolutely no um, stability programs uh, issues at all downloading into the controller in multiple environments. And we can also show you ways where you can change what channel your robot's on. Yeah. You can, there's ways to set passwords that only you you know, put in there. You can hide the SSD if you want. It's all up to you. Um, I don't quite understand this question, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Well, I, I can answer. Right, so, but he's going to answer yeah. the way he would answer it. So the Wi-Fi on the MyRio wasn't specifically for the task that we were providing. That's why for the previous competitions, we provided a white wireless access point that came with the collection, as you were supposed to use that as your connection and not the Wi-Fi that was on the MyRio. However, the Wi-Fi that is on the uh, VMX has a much better broadband and updated chips. 
which allows for better connections. Right. Okay, so the question was, am I real had a lot of disconnection issues using the Wi-Fi? So it's a two-part question. Um, and it was a, yes, the, you got to realize that the Wi-Fi chip on the MyReo itself was designed to be used. It was older and it was designed for a lot of different tasks. That's why in a competition environment, we use the access point to confirm a good direct connection uh, between the Wi-Fi. Okay, uh, the Titan is set up differently, um, the, 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 or the VMX. Sorry, uh, where I got was the the lag. Uh, because we are running, you know, straight autonomous here, so we're we're downloading code to it and running. So I'm, I'm confused about a, a question on the lag, unless we were talking about teleoperation. And we haven't noticed any, but lag. we're we're getting no no issues right right now. Um, and I can't, uh, you know, what happens at the competition and and what is run at the competition will be decided in the um, CID document. Okay. Okay, so that um, that looks like that. We updated the uh, the email. Okay, so we're uh, we're good to go, and we will see everybody tomorrow morning at eight a.m. our time. Excellent. Thank you very much.